Hi, I'm Webb Mealy. I'm a Bible scholar with a specialty in the Book of Revelation and Biblical Eschatology, and I'm going to present a paper, Five Principles for Determining Literalness in the Book of Revelation and Their Application to Revelation 14, 10 to 11, and 2010. First, a little cultural context for the biblical interpretive issues I'll be addressing. A preacher down on the boardwalk at the beach has a minor crowd. He has a little sound system and a step stool, and he challenges the crowd. Can any of you honestly say you're not a sinner deserving of the eternal wrath of God? A young man steps forward. He says, I think I'm a pretty good person. The preacher says, nodding and drawing the crowd in with his eyes. Let's see about that. He has the young man stand on a step stool. Can you say you've never told a lie? The young man blushes. Yeah, he admits I have told quite a few lies. The preacher then says, you've broken God's command. You shall not bear false witness. Don't you know that the scripture says the person who has broken the law in one place has broken the whole law? God is infinitely holy and can't allow his righteous commands to be broken. Unless you repent and believe in the Lord Jesus, you will be condemned by God's righteous judgment to suffer everlasting torment in hell. Everyone in the crowd is getting uncomfortable. Most of those who are open to the message are probably thinking, wow, God is infinitely holy. That's scary. Somehow the preacher has gotten everyone to assume that infinitely holy means infinitely merciless towards non-believers. One little sin and you're toast for all eternity. But, says the preacher, the gospel good news is that if you repent and receive Jesus into your heart as your personal savior, all your sins will be forgiven and you will go to heaven when you die, not hell. You will live in bliss with God forever. As familiar as this preaching scenario is, there are some things that are deeply wrong about it. In the first place, it's more or less completely ahistorical and individualistic. This preaching and the preaching that will follow it up in churches assumes through its silence that there's nothing sinful about Americans and other first world countries living in luxury in a world in which 10% of the world's people go to bed hungry every night. It doesn't notice that middle-class people live as though we have five planet Earth's worth of resources. It has nothing to say about the sins of complicity and gross and potentially irreversible pollution of our living planet, about complicity in horrendous acts of military aggression and mass murder that kill hundreds of thousands and even millions and completely disrupt the lives of tens of millions. It has no message of Matthew 25's judgment of the nations, which focuses on sins of omission on the part of the haves in relation to caring for the needs of the have-nots. The entire New Testament has been essentially reduced to an either-or. Either you believe in the message about Jesus and go to everlasting bliss somewhere up in the hereafter, or you, if you don't believe, you go to everlasting torment somewhere down below in the hereafter. Now, to a certain extent, I'm caricaturing, pointing to the worst kinds of polarization towards extreme individualistic and otherworldly concepts of salvation. There are plenty of preachers and plenty of believers who are moving away from that. They are coming to understand the corporate and earth-centered hope that Jesus and the New Testament authors look forward to. We are the body of Christ, and our destiny is to fulfill God's corporate design for humanity together in the new creation as the beloved city. In the new creation, heaven, the place of God's total and intimate presence, comes to earth, and so does the new Jerusalem. Its citizens come with God and with his Christ to reign on the earth. They do not abandon creation altogether and spend eternity gazing at God together off in the ether somewhere. In this paper, I'm going to demonstrate that in the Bible and in the book of Revelation in particular, the imagery associated with the final destiny of those who are rejected for inclusion in the beloved city also has a strong, in fact, central 
corporate and earthly character. Just as the faithless have banded together in their mortal lives to destroy the earth, to oppose God's prophets, to murder his son, and to persecute his faithful ones, so their final destruction will come when they band together to attempt an attack on the faithful all over again when they are granted the undeserved gift of resurrection. The picture of would-be attackers slain and burning in Isaiah 66, which Jesus appeals to when he talks about Gehenna, the final fate of the unrepentant, is not disassembled and made into something entirely different in the New Testament. It is reaffirmed and explicitly tied to the resurrection of the rest of the dead in the book of Revelation. In service of demonstrating this, I'm going to adapt some material from my latest book, The Bad Place, or Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Hell But Were Afraid to Ask. This material is from a section discussing the book of Revelation called Five Principles for Deciding Whether to Take Things Literally. All right. I think it would be generally agreed that not everything in the Bible is to be taken literally, especially in the book of Revelation. It's a rare person who will say that the devil is a literal seven-headed dragon and that Jesus practices a unique martial art in which he grasps the hilt of a sword in his teeth. But how do we decide what imagery to take literally in the book of Revelation and how literally to take it? After all, when we look carefully, it becomes evident that Revelation's visions represent nearly everything that they reveal in symbolic terms. Most of us, for example, would agree that God is not going to cultivate oysters 20 stories tall in order to supply the single pearl gates of the New Jerusalem. We can call these kinds of imagery symbols, images, me metaphors, figures of speech, and the like, but let's not get caught up in an overcomplicated discussion of the technicalities of how they convey the information that they bring forward in non-literal ways. To simplify, let's just agree that God, through John, communicates things in visions by the means of word pictures. And let's agree that word pictures can either be literal or non-literal. I propose for consideration the following five principles for interpreting word pictures in Revelation. Principle one. Each individual word picture should be interpreted so that it remains self-consistent throughout Revelation. We shouldn't interpret a word picture literally in one instance and then non-literally in another instance. For example, once we understand that white clothing symbolizes purity, we should understand every instance of it in Revelation as symbolizing purity. We shouldn't pick out the one instance like, say, Revelation 4.4 4, and say, in that case, John's talking about ordinary white garments. Similarly, we discover in Revelation 22.16 that Jesus calls himself the bright morning star. Learning this commits us to the same interpretation of Christ's promise to give the overcomer the morning star in Revelation 2.28. When we interpret Revelation 2.28 so that it is consistent with Revelation 22.16, we understand that Jesus has promised that he will give himself to the overcomer when he comes in glory. The word picture of the morning star does not mean one thing in one place in Revelation and something else entirely different in another place. So that's principle one. Principle two says, any word picture should be interpreted so that its literalness matches its literalness within any Old Testament prophecy that John alludes to in using it. If a word picture is literal in its Old Testament prophetic context, we should assume that it's going to be literal in Revelation. If it's non-literal in its Old Testament prophetic context, we should assume that it's going to be non-literal in Revelation. Now, why should we expect there to be this kind of congruence and concordance because John clearly understands his visions to be part of one integrated stream of prophetic revelation from God. John is not snipping things from the Old Testament and pasting them together like a collage made from magazine cuttings. 
without reference to their original meaning or context. He's giving us an account of actual visions that he experienced as he was prayerful in the spirit on a Sunday morning on Patmos. When John recognizes in his visionary state that what he is seeing is something that another prophet saw before him, he takes care to describe his vision in words that alert his readers to the presence of a connection. He looks upon all biblical prophecy, including his own, as one interconnected revelation. And therefore, we should expect the function of word pictures in Revelation to be organically connected to their function in the visions of the Old Testament prophets. For example, in Daniel 7, the beast with its ten horns is a composite symbol of the last evil empire in human history and the sequence of rulers leading up to its final king. Likewise, in Revelation, the beast with its multiple heads and horns is a composite symbol of the last great evil empire and the sequence of rulers leading up to its final king. Principle three, any word picture should be interpreted so that it makes sense when interpreted in the context of closely related word pictures in the book of Revelation. For example, John tells us in Revelation 4, 5, that the seven blazing lamps in front of God's throne in heaven are the seven spirits of God. He later tells us that he sees golden bowls full of incense, which is the prayers of the holy ones. Comments like these make it clear that John does not take his visions of the heavenly temple and its equipment literally, as though there were literal, physical golden lamps and bowls in heaven. The heavenly temple and its individual elements symbolize truths about God and his relationship with humanity and the creation. Accordingly, when we encounter other temple-related word pictures, we should apply what John has told us in these two cases. For instance, in Revelation 6, 9, John sees underneath the altar of sacrifice the souls of those who'd been slaughtered because of the word of God and because of the testimony that they'd maintain. In the Old Testament, the blood of animals offered to God is to be poured out at the base of the altar of sacrifice. John's vision tells us that these slain witnesses have had their lives poured out, but that God has accepted their lives as a holy offering to him, and their lives are held safe by God. Here are some non-literal heavenly equipment in Revelation. There's the lamps, the incense altar, the altar of sacrifice, the bronze sea, the sea of glass, in other words, is, corresponds to the bronze sea. The curtain before the Holy of Holies, we see a reference to that when the sky is stripped from above and God's throne is revealed. And the Ark of the Covenant, which is the throne of God with its cherubim. Let's go on to principle four. Any word picture should be interpreted so that it remains compatible with non-figurative, which is to say straightforward, informational, and interpretive statements that John gives us. For example, in Revelation 1, 12, 16, and 20, John sees seven lampstands, and he sees seven stars in Jesus' hand. Jesus interprets these vision elements for John. The seven lampstands are, in other words, they symbolize or represent the seven churches. And the seven stars are, that is, the seven stars symbolize the angels of the seven churches, that is, the messengers that conveyed John's message to the churches from him. Similarly, in Revelation 4, 5, John sees seven torches of fire burning in front of God's throne, which are the seven spirits of God. It's no more valid to say that the lamps that John sees in Revelation 1 and the torches that he sees in Revelation 4 are also real, which is to say literal golden lamps and torches, than it is to say that the seven stars that he sees in Jesus' hand are also seven actual literal stars somewhere in the universe. As we saw just above, John explains that the incense offered to God by the 24 elders is 
the prayers of the holy ones. The word picture of burning incense is not literal. It represents communication, prayers being received by God. Trying to hold that it is also literal in some way is to miss the point. John is trying to teach us how to understand the elements of his visions as he understands them. In Revelation 5-6, John sees a lamb standing as though slaughtered, and he sees that it has seven horns and seven eyes. He explains that the lamb's eyes are, which is to say they represent, the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. In Revelation 16, 13 to 14, John sees three frogs coming out of the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. He immediately explains what he understands these frogs to represent. They are demonic spirits that perform signs and they go out to the kings of the earth to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. They're not also, at the same time, literal biological frogs. Finally, let's look at an example that is a little more involved. In Revelation 21, 23 to 24, we read of the new Jerusalem that the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. This word picture of the nations and kings of the earth being illuminated by the glory of God and bringing gifts into the new Jerusalem looks on first glance like a promise that the wicked kings of the earth, which we had seen again and again previously in Revelation, along with all humanity, will have access to the new Jerusalem. But this promise must be interpreted by John's interpretive words in Revelation 21, 27. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. John clearly explains that the promise of entry to the New Jerusalem applies only to the Holy Ones, only to the citizens of the Holy City. Thus, in the New Creation and the New Jerusalem, the Holy Ones are the kings of the earth, and they constitute all of humanity on the earth. When you take into account John's own explanatory words, the more literalistic universal salvation interpretation of the picture of the nations coming into the New Jerusalem is ruled out. Principle 5 says any word picture should be interpreted so that it remains compatible with the teachings of Jesus above all, since the resurrected Jesus is the source of the book of Revelation, see Revelation 1 verse 1 but also with the teachings of the authors of the New Testament and the Bible in general. For example, we don't conclude from John's vision of God the Father on the throne that God, who made literally everything, is actually a humanoid who sits on a literal throne. And we don't conclude from John's repeated use of the expression, the seven spirits, that there are actually seven separate Holy Spirits. We understand from numerous passages that there is one Holy Spirit. Our knowledge of this is strong enough that we interpret John's words in the light of Zechariah 4.10 as referring to the creation-wide scope of the Spirit's activity. Similarly, we don't suddenly learn that Jesus literally incarnated himself as a lamb as well as as a human being when John sees him as a lamb standing as those slain. Our general knowledge of biblical truth helps guide our interpretation of the literalness or non-literalness of the things that John sees. Let's now apply each of these five principles to the question of whether we should understand the smoke of their torment as literally going up forever and ever in Revelation 14:11, and whether we should understand the day and night forever and ever torment of the devil, the beast, and the false prophet in Revelation 20.10 as literally going on forever. Principle 1 says, 
that we should expect the literalness of a word picture to match the literalness that it has elsewhere in Revelation. There is, it turns out, exactly one other place in Revelation besides Revelation 14.11 in which we hear of smoke going up forever and ever. Let's see if it can be taken literally. So Revelation 19.3 says, Hallelujah, her smoke goes up forever and ever, and that refers to Babylon the Great, which is destroyed by fire, just prophesied in chapter 18. Babylon's destruction is to come all in one day and in one hour. The beast, joined by the kings of Babylon's enemies, betrays the great city of Babylon and together they completely destroy it with fire. Revelation 19.3 is also a reference back to Revelation 14.8-11 and to Isaiah 34.10. In eight, Revelation 18.21, the sudden and final end of Babylon the Great was conveyed by using a dramatic word picture in which an angel threw an upper millstone into the deep sea, which alludes to Jeremiah 51, 63-64, a prophecy against ancient Babylon. Then, in Revelation 19.3, Babylon's end is celebrated in dramatic imagery of a burnt ruin that never stops smoldering. The force of this imagery, which is projected into the ages of the ages, is that Babylon's destruction will be irrevocable, permanent, and final. Ruins that are imagined as smoldering forever are, by force of logic, imagined as forever left unrebuilt and uninhabited. In Revelation 19.3, John's readers are being assured that Babylon, the greatest enemy of God's people ever to appear on earth, will never ever rise again. Let's pause for a moment and consider whether it is even possible to interpret this idea of everlasting smoldering literally. Suppose we agree that Babylon the Great symbolizes a human city or maybe even a civilization pictured as a great city, which achieves the status of world empire on earth at the end of this age. Now let's dare to imagine something like a great nuclear conflagration, which is to be instigated by the beast and the ten horns, leaders of Babylon's uh, opponent nations to which he defects. Then let's imagine that the incendiary attack instantly kills a large portion of humanity and destroys every living thing that it touches within the borders of Babylon the Great. Now let's remind ourselves that God's plans for this earth, according to Revelation, include the radical dissolution of the current earth and its atmosphere, as we see in chapter 6, verses 12 to 14, at the end of chapter 16, in Revelation 20, 11, and 21, 1. A after that, the fleeing away of the original heavens and earth, there is a radical renovation, 21 verses 1 to 4. As a result, if we are to interpret uh, Revelation 19.3 literally, we will be required to imagine that God, in the process of renewing the entire creation, plans to do one of two things. One, miraculously preserve that portion of the earth where Babylon stands in desolate and unrenovated state for all eternity, or two, miraculously lift the smoldering wreck of Babylon the Great from the skin of the present earth and hold it in suspense while recreating the world and then transplant it into the new creation, rather like a dead rotting scab that God chooses to transplant into the pristine resurrected body of the new earth and leave unhealed for all eternity. This idea of a smoldering Babylon miraculously preserved and or transported into the new creation so that it can throw toxic smoke into the skies of the new creation forever and ever is obviously intolerable to the Christian imagination. This concept flies in the face of the beauty and wholeness of the picture painted in Revelation 21 and 22. Therefore, Revelation 19.3 cannot be, and is certainly not to be, taken literally in regard to its temporal force.
Principle one tells us that we should not interpret a word picture more literally in one place in Revelation and non-literally in another, but that we should interpret each word picture consistently in all its instances. Since the everlasting smoldering in Revelation 19 verse 3 cannot be taken literally, principle one tells us that the word picture of everlasting smoking in Revelation 14 11 should not be taken literally either. We'll talk in greater depth about Revelation 19.3 below. Given that there is similar imagery of everlasting day and night forever and ever burning in Revelation 20 verse 10, principle one raises the question, might this imagery also have non-literal force? The application is less clear, however, than in the case of Revelation 14 verse 11. In this case, there is no smoke to be pictured as rising forever and ever, but rather the devil and his cohort are pictured as suffering torment in the pool of fire forever and ever. The question of literalness is thus not settled decisively one way or the other. Uh, by the application of principle one, the imageries are close, but not identical. Principle two tells us that a word picture in Revelation should be interpreted so that its literalness matches that of any Old Testament passage that it alludes to. Revelation 14, 11 and 20, 10 very clearly allude to the word picture in Isaiah 34, 9 to 10, in which the fields and streams of Edom are pictured as burning forever with sulfur and pitch. Let's look first at the close verbal parallels between Isaiah 34 and Revelation 14, 10 to 11. We have sulfur, fire or burning, night and day, day and night, smoke going up, and forever and ever. The verbal parallels between Isaiah 34 and Revelation 2010 are equally clear and dramatic. We have parallels sulfur, fire, burning, day and night, and forever and ever. Equally close and even more numerous points of parallelism can be seen between Isaiah 34 and Revelation 18 to 19. We have, I'll just do the uh, arrow so you can follow it yourself. This tells us that the same mode of divine revelation is at play in all three of these passages. Isaiah 34, Revelation 14, and Revelation 18 to 19. We can apply the same thought experiment to Isaiah 34, 9 to 10, as we did to Revelation 19, 3. Do we believe that God is going to miraculously transport poisonous and poisoned Edom into the new creation? so that its streams of burning pitch and fields of burning sulfur can spew toxic smoke into the skies of the new creation forever? Or do we believe that the word picture of an everlasting smoldering wasteland is intended to assure the people of God that perennial enemies such as Edom will never again arise to threaten the faithful? If the second of these is what we believe, then principle two tells us that we should not take the everlasting smoke of torment in Revelation 14.11 or the devil's day and night forever and ever torment in 2010 literally either. We should take this language as a hyperbolic way of expressing the completeness and the finality of God's destruction of dangerous enemies and the permanence of its results in each case. Now, someone might respond, in the deepest sense, Revelation 19.3 and Isaiah 34.9-10 are actually pictures of the torments of the lost in hell. 
Revelation 19.3 and Isaiah 34.9-10 are not ultimately about literal Edom or Babylon the Great in this age, but uh, they refer to all the lost and not just to the literal followers of the beast as stated in the text of Revelation 14.11. To anyone who wants to try this move, I reply that you need to decide whether you're going to be a literalist or not. Aren't you now tossing aside the very literalism that you have always claimed required you to believe in everlasting torment and indeed resorting to allegory so that you can salvage your belief in everlasting torment when literalism leads to impossible results? Wouldn't it make better sense to admit that prophetic scripture sometimes uses temporal hyperbole and to be open in principle to the possibility that temporal hyperbole is at play in Revelation 14.11 and 20.10. I've proven elsewhere in technical detail that Revelation 20 verses 7 to 10 pictures the great and last rebellion of the devil and all the resurrected unrepentant. I've proven that this passage has intimate links to Isaiah 26 verses 10 to 11 and Isaiah 26 20 through 27 5. Each of these portions of the so-called Isaiah apocalypse pictures the same moment of the final judgment and permanent removal of all the forces of deadly danger to the faithful, including the great dragon, which John identifies as the devil. As I mentioned at the beginning of this paper, Christians typically think about the final disposition of those who they refer to as the lost as though it is something they experience in a completely passive way. God drags sinners out of the realm of the dead. They stand defenseless before the bench of divine judgment. They're condemned and they're forthwith individually sentenced to and consigned to some form of everlasting torment whose intensity somehow matches their particular sins. Crucial pictures of the end of the unrepentant in Isaiah, especially Isaiah 26, 10 to 11, Isaiah 26, 20 to 27, 5, and Isaiah 66, 22 to 24, followed by Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10, reveal created beings ferociously active in attempted violence against God's faithful ones in the specific context of the glorious earthly reign of God and the faithful. The unrepentant ones are not pictured as helpless pawns to be endlessly dangled in fiery torments at God's pleasure, but as dangerous attackers who must be stopped once for all for the protection of God's beloved community. Let's look at some portions from the Isaiah Apocalypse for a moment alongside their parallels in Revelation. John clearly understands that he is seeing in the scene he describes in Revelation 20 verses 7 to 10 the same last judgment and fiery destruction of the forces of wickedness that is revealed in Isaiah 26 10 to 11 and 26 21 to 27 5. Now I'm going to just uh, talk you through it. Here we have Isaiah 24 1 to 20. That's closely paralleled by a number of things in Revelation, especially chapter 6, where you see the disturbance, the radical disturbance of the physical world, uh, the dis loss of all people of all social statuses. Uh, often in this age, uh, if some disaster comes, those who are rich enough can figure out how to keep out of it. But in this case, everyone from every social location and political status and so on is affected equally. No one escapes among those who are wicked. We have the same theme coming up when Christ is shown coming in glory in chapter 19, but that is because God's coming in glory as king to establish his kingdom is the same thing as Christ's coming in glory as his Messiah to establish his kingdom. But we have the same language. They're definitely connected. So the common elements are the structure of the physical earth will be destroyed. 
all classes of sinners and all sinners without exception will perish and the earth will fall according to the last verses in Isaiah there never to rise again this is not a temporary judgment on the earth this is the end of this age and the end of humanity on earth the second stage is that God expels rebel rebellious angelic and human beings from the creation and imprisons them together in the abyss for a long time so here we have Isaiah 24 verses 21 to 22 that following right on from what we just read and this is Revelation 19 19 through 23 here's the kings of the earth here's everyone is going to be thrown in the pit of the underworld in Isaiah but in Revelation 19 they're all slain by the sword of the one who sat on the horse namely Jesus but he is the one who has the keys of death and Hades if he slays you he sends you to the prison of Hades which is a Greek way of talking about the underworld uh, the same thing as Sheol and the pit so they're tracking The devil gets thrown into the abyss and close and it's closed and sealed over him he is not only imprisoned uh, in the abyss but he's chained up within the prison he's put a chain on him and then he's tossed in there with the chain on and then it's locked over him and sealed in Isaiah oh yes so, so uh, those who were slain by the sword also do not come to life until after the thousand years are ended that parallels the fact that the kings of the earth and all the unworthy on the earth are sent to prison with the devil or with the uh, hosts of heaven on high the rebels anyways and they're all imprisoned in the underworld together for a long time it says after many days they will be punished but uh, in the book of Revelation that period is quantified as a thousand years a kind of round number for an age we're still tracking closely here third stage is God reigns in glory and throws a great feast for the faithful of all nations God puts an end to death and crying and tears that's in uh, the last verses of uh, Isaiah 24 and the verses of Isaiah 25 the moon will be abashed the sun will be ashamed and the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders he will manifest his glory and then a few verses later on this mountain in other words Mount Zion the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a face of rich food he will swallow up death forever the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces there are unique parallels between that and all these passages in the book of Revelation chapter 21 we have a new Jerusalem that's on a high mountain we have God promising to wipe away every tear from their eyes in uh, the context of the new creation we have the death will no longer exist and the glory of God is going to be the central characteristic of this new situation so absolutely close tracking between Isaiah apocalypse and the New Testament apocalypse oh that's an interesting one so it says the source of her light speaking of the New Jerusalem in verse 11 of chapter 21 the source of her light was like a priceless gem like a crystal clear diamond now translations for some reason I don't understand translate that as her light was like a precious gem that is not correct the word foster uh, which is the Greek word that's translated as her light is a light source or let me put it this way it's the light that shines on somebody and not the light that shines from them so her light 
has to be a light that shines on her. And it's very clear if you compare this verse with the description of the one sitting on the throne in chapter 4, that it is God's glory that is her light source. That's why the sun's ashamed and the moon does not uh, shed its light, because they are overshadowed by the glory of God. I don't take that literally, but that's the imagery. Oh, and so him who sits on the throne is like a diamond, and Jerusalem in the new age, in the glorious kingdom of God, will be called the throne of the Lord. So the entire new Jerusalem is God's throne, and that's why it all shines with God's glory. After this, in uh, the Isaiah Apocalypse, we have Jerusalem coming under God's protection and being invulnerable to every kind of attack. This is Isaiah chapter 26, verses 1 to 2. In the, on that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. The Lord sets up victory like walls and bulwarks. Open the gates so that the righteous nation that keeps faith may come in. So, Revelation 21, once again, diamond hard walls. <laughs> There's nothing harder in human knowledge than that. We have, uh, yeah, so the God is the one who's the protector, like the wall is God. There's the thing I was mentioning, the comparison between the light of the moon and the sun and the glory of God. We're still closely, closely uh, tracking from Isaiah 24 and 25 and 26. The gates will never be shut, says John, and open the gates so that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. Uh, and clearly, the righteous nation is invited in, according to Isaiah, and John says, nothing unholy or anyone that does filthy things or any liar is ever going to enter it, only those who are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. So we're still absolutely on the same kind of eschatological page here. They're tracking, these two passages are tracking with each other. Revelation 19 to 21 or 22 and Isaiah 24 to 27. Now, now we've got the sense that these two things are very close to each other. I want to go and look at Isaiah 24 to 27 in some more detail. The next stage in Isaiah is that there is an attack on the faithful in the context of the glorious kingdom. It says, when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Yeah, sure they did. They got imprisoned in the underworld for their sins for a long time. If faithful is given to the wicked, he does not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he deals corruptly and does not see the majesty of the Lord. Who are these wicked folks? Because every single human being who is unrighteous perished in the end of chapter 24. The earth collapsed uh, and every single human being died except for those who were the faithful. And so who are these folks? John has an understanding of who they are. He tells us that they are the resurrected unrepentant. They are the ones who had been captured and thrown in the underworld for a long time, for many days, according to Isaiah 24, 22. But now they've been released. It says, in the land of uprightness, that is in the glorious kingdom, he deals corruptly and does not see the majesty of the Lord. Strangely enough, the, uh, the, uh, the faithless, even in the context of the glorious kingdom where God's glory is over all. They still can't see God. They're blind to God's glory and God's presence and God's protective ability. They just see easy pickings. But it says, O Lord, your hand is lifted up and they do not see it. Let them see the, your zeal for your people and be ashamed. Let fire for your adversaries consume them. 
parallel, this is quite closely paralleled by Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10. The devil is a, has been uh, imprisoned for a thousand years, many days in the underworld, along with all the uh, unrepentant. And at the end, he is released. And so are a bunch of human beings, apparently. It says, they came up on the broad plain of the earth. This is verse 9 on the right-hand side. And surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. You know, you can't come up on a broad plain unless you're underneath it. This is a broad hint that John is giving us that those who show up after the thousand years along with the devil are those whom he said would not come to life until after the thousand years were ended. And also it said, he said that the, the devil would be released from his prison after the thousand years were ended. Well, here they all are. Those who had been imprisoned in the underworld together now come up, but they got the same ideas that they had in this sinful age. They wanted to attack and get stuff uh, off of people who were vulnerable. And it doesn't happen that way this time. Fire comes down from heaven and devours them. Now, interestingly enough, in the context of yeah, the glorious kingdom, we have this. Come, my people, enter into your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the wrath is past. For the Lord comes out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. In that day, what day? The day in which the Lord utterly and finally punishes the sinners. The Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. He will slay the dragon that is in the sea. John is absolutely referring to this in chapter 20. He knows that in the day in which the unrepentant have their last encounter with God, that will be the day when the devil has his last stand and he will be destroyed. Isaiah's and John's common description of the ultimate confrontation between God and the human and cosmic forces of obstinate evil leads not to the question, will God ever be done tormenting these sinful beings, but rather to the question, will God's beloved always have to worry about enemies periodically being allowed to attack them? It is to this situation that John applies the word picture from Isaiah 34.10 with its temporally hyperbolic language of day and night forever and ever. Will deadly enemies, the devil in particular, spring up perennially forever? No, they will be uprooted and destroyed in a way that is both total and absolutely permanent. That is the force of the forever and ever burning and or smoking language in all the passages in which it occurs. Principle 3 tells us that we should always interpret word pictures in Revelation so that they work harmoniously together with related word pictures in Revelation. We've already talked in some detail under Principle 1 about the relationship between Revelation 14, 10 to 11 and Revelation 19, 3, so we'll consider that discussion sufficient as regards Principle 3. Now, let's turn to Revelation's word pictures related to those in Revelation 27 to 10. I would argue that they are almost all to be found in the Oracle of Babylon the Great's fiery destruction in Revelation 18, 1 to 19, 3. If we can discern how the words and images in that passage work in terms of literary dynamics, we can then attempt to assess whether, how, and how closely the words and images in Revelation 20 verses 7 to 10 work harmoniously together with them. So as a first step, let me give a basic exposition of the literary dynamics of the Oracle of Babylon's destruction. First, in Revelation 18, 1 to 20, John gives a detailed prophecy that Babylon will suddenly, completely, and permanently be destroyed by fire in one day. That's 18, 8, and 10. In one hour. 
The descriptions in this section remind the readers that no one who betrays the Jesus by worshiping the beast will escape the same kind of fiery destruction. Revelation 14, 9 to 12 will absolutely come to mind as they read Revelation 18. That is intentional. Second, John sees an angel perform a symbolic action. A powerful angel lifted up a stone like a huge millstone and threw it into the ocean. He said, that's how quickly Babylon, the great city, is going to be overthrown. She'll never be found again. So we've gone from fiery imagery to watery imagery, but both are in service of the same purpose, emphasizing the total and permanent destruction of Babylon the Great. A millstone cast into the deepest ocean will never come back up. I should mention that the permanence issue is crucial because ancient cities somewhat regularly burned down, but people began to rebuild as soon as the ashes were cool, and it was common for them to renew to uh, return to their former status within a generation or less. Just the way, say, Tokyo and Berlin bounced back from being bombed into rubble in World War II. Third, right after the symbolic casting of the millstone, the angel goes on to prophesy about sights and sounds that will never be seen or heard uh, again among the ruins of Babylon. The sound of harp players and singers, flutists and trumpet players, they're never going to be heard in you anymore. No worker of any skilled trade is going to be found in you again. The sound of a mill grinding flour is never going to be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp is never going to be seen in you anymore. The sound of a bride and groom is never going to be heard in you anymore. The image of a millstone thrown in the ocean and the poem about the absence of human sights and sounds that follows it convey one and the same message. The coming destruction will be total and the desolation that results will be permanent, everlasting. Isaiah accomplishes something very similar in Isaiah 34, 10b to 17. After presenting the hyperbolic picture of everlasting toxic burning and smoking of all the fields and the streams in Edom in Isaiah 34, 9 to 10a, Isaiah turns to an extended poem celebrating the peace and quiet that all the desert creatures will enjoy forever. Each species will have peace because their land will belong to them, with no humans to bother them ever again. Fourth and lastly, to cap off the oracle of Babylon's destruction, John hears voices of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, her smoke grows up forever and ever. That's 19.3. This unmistakable quotation from Isaiah 34.10, which, like its source, is impossible to take literally, adds the final element to this fourfold description of Babylon's destruction. Add them all together, and you don't get four independent pieces of literary information about the destiny of Babylon, but one. All the imageries, all the word pictures, serve the one purpose to assure the believers that Babylon the Great will be completely and above all permanently destroyed. These four complementary descriptions of Babylon's fate present us with specific and relevant precedent right in the nearby narrative of Revelation for the complex communication technique that I claim John uses in Revelation 20 verses 7 to 15. This brief look at the literary workings of the oracle of the destruction of Babylon the Great shows that it is normal in Revelation that the same reality should be expressed by means of layered imagery or, to use a familiar term that commentators use, recapitulation. I'd like now to sketch the literary dynamics of Revelation 20 and to show how observing the use of image layering or recapitulation adds significant further evidence that imagery of everlasting burning in Revelation 20 verse 10 should be understood as temporal hyperbole. First, following Christ's slaying of the kings of the earth and their armies in Revelation 19, 18 to 21, John sees an angel capture the devil and throw him in chains into the underworld. 
This connects John's narrative with the narrative of Isaiah 24, which ends with the co-imprisonment of the hosts, that is, armies of heaven, and the kings of the earth in the pit, a familiar Hebrew way of talking about the underworld, and that was for many days, while the Lord reigned in glory on Mount Zion. That's Isaiah 24, verse 23. John quantifies the many days during which the devil and presumably all of his rebellious angelic hosts, if you look back to chapter 12, you'll see that the devil had an army that fought and lost and got kicked out of heaven. When Christ comes in glory, he gets kicked out of the earth too, along with all, presumably with all his angelic hosts and with the kings of the earth who were with him uh, trying to oppose Christ's coming in glory. But all of those got slain too and those got tossed in the underworld and were imprisoned for a thousand years along with the devil. Now, Jews and Christians imagined a thousand years as a kind of standard or ideal length for an age. So it's a round number. It's kind of symbolic. It needn't be absolutely literal. But it certainly qualifies as for many days, as in Isaiah 24. Next, John sees thrones set up, and he sees those who have been slain for their testimony and resistance to the beast, and perhaps those who persevered in resisting the beast, but who were somehow spared from martyrdom. And they all rise and reign with Christ as priestly kings for the thousand years of the devil's imprisonment. The rest of the dead, including the kings of the earth and the armies of the beast who were slain at Christ's coming in glory, do not come to life which is to say they are left imprisoned in the underworld along with the devil and his angels for the thousand years. When the thousand years are over, the devil is released and we readers immediately ask ourselves, won't the rest of the dead also be released now from the underworld? That's what we were just told in the previous verse, 26. It says the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. That's the same phrase that's, uh, that's used to say when the devil gets out when the thousand years are ended. Sure enough, the devil finds himself a horde of human followers as numberless as the sand of the seashore who come up on the broad plain of the earth, Revelation 20, verse 8, which is conceptually impossible if you're not first underneath the broad plain of the earth. This is the humans who have until now been incarcerated in the underworld with the devil, but who now, when the thousand years are completed, stand resurrected on the earth. They all, angelic and human beings alike, attempt one unified attack on the camp of the saints, the holy city, and are consumed by fire from heaven, just as Isaiah prayed in Isaiah 26, 10 to 11. The devil, who as an angel can easily flee such a torrent of fire, is caught and thrown into the pool that it forms and is incinerated like the rest. By the way, people are used to thinking of a lake of fire. A lake is a permanent feature. A pool is a temporary, in general, a temporary feature. But the word limne in Greek is its first definition is a pool, especially a pool that's left after the tide comes in. When the tide comes out and you've got tide pools, that's limne. Or if a rainstorm comes and leaves a big giant puddle, that's a limne. Or if a river overflows its banks and leaves big pools outside its normal banks. Those are limnes. So this is what happens. A torrent of fire comes down from heaven and it pools on the earth and the devil is not allowed to escape from that. I mean the humans are trapped. They you know they can't fly away but the devil could but he is grabbed and he's tossed into this pool of fire. Now in Revelation 20, verse 11, we see a courtroom scene in front of God, the judge, before whom we had seen heaven and earth flee in the sixth seal in chapter 6. Apparently, we're seeing this all over again. The dead, above whom the ceiling of the earth has just been stripped away like the lid of a sardine can, stand exposed in the underworld before the enthroned one, now to be judged according to their actions done as mortals, as written in the books. That's verse 12. Next, they're drawn out of the realms of the dead and judged by their actions. That's verse 13. Everyone who's not a citizen of the New Jerusalem ends up being cast into the pool of fire, the second death. 
The readers are presented in the relationship between Revelation 27 to 10 and 20, 11 to 15 with the same pattern of image layering that they just witnessed in Revelation 19, 11 to 21 and 24 to 6. The same moment of judgment is presented first as a conflict and divine victory and then as a courtroom scene. Astute readers have understood that Christ's coming in glory is at the same time both a battle and a trial. This double character can be also seen clearly in Daniel 7 and in Revelation 11, 15 to 18, both of which form the backdrop of both 1911 to 21 and Revelation 24 to 6. The relationships between Revelation 19 to 21 and 24 to 6 on the one hand and between 27 to 10 and 11 to 15 on the other hand conform to the classic pattern of recapitulation in which a single eschatological event or reality is presented two or more times in a different visual form or so to speak from different angles. This narrative analysis of Revelation 21 to 15 opens up unique forms of evidence that the annihilation, the permanent removal of the devil and all of his followers is the deeper story behind the word pictures of Revelation 29 to 10. First of all, note how Revelation 27 to 10 is immediately preceded in verse 6 by a reference to the second death, to which the rest of the dead which is to say those kept incarcerated in the underworld for the thousand years appear to be vulnerable. The expression is repeated in 2014 and 21 8, and in the latter two verses it interprets the pool of fire and sulfur. So before we ever see any language about everlasting torment, we already have been preloaded with the idea of a second and presumably final death that will befall the resurrected unrepentant. We're also presented first with two images, would-be attackers of the faithful being inundated by fire from heaven, and the devil being tossed into and presumably drowned in the pool of fire that forms from the fiery downpour. Together these two elements can hardly avoid suggesting the idea that unrepentant humans and angels will face instant and complete incineration. In addition, we have John's description of the fire as coming down and devouring them, recalling scenes in 2 Kings 1.10 where Elijah calls down fire from heaven to the guys who are trying to arrest him, and of course Isaiah 26.11. In the midst of these descriptions of engulfing and consuming fire, drowning fire, and the second death, we encounter a picture of torment day and night forever and ever. For Satan, the beast, and the false prophet, the most dangerous enemies of humanity ever to appear on the earth. Beings holding major responsibility for the demise of the entire human race and of the earth itself, they together with their collaborators merit the strongest language for the final and irrevocable destruction within the covers of Scripture. The unique, temporarily hyperbolic language of Isaiah 34, 9-10, which assures the faithful that their deadliest enemies will never, ever rise again. Interesting that Daniel 7 also has a river of fire coming out and it consumes the beast in Daniel 7. Many people will think that this is evidence that we should read the battle of Gog and Magog as the same battle as the one in which the Antichrist or the beast is killed and thrown into the lake of fire. But there are reasons that you will learn if you read my technical books, that that will not work uh, in terms of literary dynamics. Of course, we saw in examining the narrative dynamics of the Oracle of the Destruction of Babylon, the, that multiple kinds of language and imagery clearly expressed instantness, totality, and permanence of Babylon's removal by fire. 
Capping all of these off was the temporarily hyperbolic language of ruins smoking for all eternity. All of the imagery, from the more or less literal to the symbolic, to the fantastic and hyperbolic, function together harmoniously to convey the firm assurance Babylon will never rise to threaten the faithful again. The same narrative compositional dynamic in which multiple forms of description are employed clearly shows up again in relation to the destruction of the devil and the rest of the dead after the thousand years. In both passages we have the more or less literal, the second death and the picture of instant destruction by fire. There's the less literal and or the symbolic, the image of the pool of fire in which those outside the city's walls are drowned and which manages to engulf the devil himself and the fantastic and the hyperbolic, the image of the devil and his henchmen somehow continuing to drown in the pool of fire forever and ever. There's not only unity and harmony between the internal descriptive elements of the Babylon Oracle by itself and the elements of the double precedation of the final judgment by itself, but the two sections also exhibit congruence between them as compositional wholes. They resonate with and are harmoni harmonious with one another in their use of imagery and words. Now that was a long, long exposition applying principle three, which tells us that we should always interpret word pictures in Revelation so that they work harmoniously together with related word pictures in Revelation. Let's turn now to principle four. Principle four says that any word picture should be interpreted so that it remains compatible with non-figurative and interpretive statements that John gives us. We saw in applying principle three just now that John twice interprets, in other words, explains the pool of fire as the second death. That's 2014 and 21.8. Whereas the pool of fire is a word picture, the second death looks more like a straightforward non-pictorial language. Principle four dictates that we rely on the non-pictorial and the interpretive information to interpret the material presented in word pictures. The concept of the second and uh, the second death, in other words, should determine how we understand the imagery of the pool of fire rather than the word picture of the pool of fire determining how we understand the concept of the second death. Here are a whole bunch of examples of things that John sees and explains, and you see the pattern of how it works. The seven stars are, that is, they represent the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. He sees seven torches of fire, which he are the seven spirits of God. They, he sees seven eyes on the lamb standing as if slain, and they are the seven spirits of God too. The incense he sees in heaven is the prayers of the saints. The three frogs are the three unclean spirits that go out to gather the kings of the earth to Armageddon. The seven heads of the beasts are, that is, they represent in some way, the seven mountains and seven kings. The waters that you saw are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. The woman you saw is the great city. She's not a literal woman. The waters are not literal waters. The seven heads of the beast are not seven literal heads. There's not three literal frogs. There's no literal incense. There's no literal seven eyes or seven torches. It's all symbolic and it's being explained by John so that you'll understand that it is symbolic. The fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. It's not linen, it's representing a picture of linen representing the righteous deeds of the saints. The dragon who is the devil and, the, and Satan, he's not a literal dragon, he's not a literal serpent. It's a representation, a pictorial representation of the devil, symbolic. There's another book opened and it is the book of life. This one might be slightly different. That's like it identifies it. Nonetheless, there are not literal paper books in heaven. 
there are records kept in the mind of God, and perhaps among his faithful ones in, in his company in heaven. Uh, so everything is kept, but it's not in a literal book. The pool that burns with fire and sulfur and is the second death. Right? We've got a visual and an interpretation. Over and over again, it's, again, it's the same pattern. John's explanation tell the reader what things and people in his visions represent. What precedes the verb is the symbolic pictorial representation, and what follows the verb is the referent, the actual thing. The second death is not a symbolic way of referring to the pool of fire. Rather, the pool of fire is a symbolic way of picturing the second death. As we've seen, there's no way to take everything we have here literally. We either take the second death as an exceedingly non-literal way of talking about an everlasting and tortured form of resurrected life, or we take the second death as one among a whole number of clues that invite us to interpret the language of day and night forever and ever, non-literally, in Revelation 14.11 and 20.10. Principle 4 recommends the second of these two approaches. Those who opt for the first approach must choose the less literal interpretation over the more literal, and they must be prepared to justify it in the face of clear and meaningful alternatives in the text. Principle 5 says that any word picture should be interpreted so that it remains compatible with the teachings of Jesus above all, since he is the source of the book of Revelation, see Revelation 1 verse 1, but also with the teachings of the authors of the New Testament and the Bible in general. It's well known that when Jesus uses the word Gehenna as a way of referring to the end, the final fate of the unrepentant, he is alluding to Isaiah 66, 22 to 24. That passage says, As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and your descendants endure. And they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me, and the worms that eat them will not die, and the fire that burns them will not be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. Far from representing a state of everlasting torment applied to individuals in some abstracted space that is separate from creation, Biblical Gehenna names a place outside the New Jerusalem of the new creation where the rebellious and the unrepentant attempt for the last time to attack the people of God. So we have in Isaiah 30, 30 the, uh, the place named Topeth. And that turns out to be the same place as the Valley of the Son of Hinnom. And that, in turn, is what Jesus refers to as Gehenna. And when he thinks of Gehenna, he's thinking about Isaiah 66, because he alludes to it in uh, Mark 9, 47-48. See what we got here. Topeth. We got Topeth or the Valley of ben Hinnom. That is just uh, explained by Jeremiah that it's the same place. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, Gehenna is just a Greek, or a, a, sorry, a first century Hebrew way of talking about the valley of the son of Hinnom. So we have worms in Isaiah 66. Jesus has worms, we have fire that cannot be quenched, and uh, Isaiah 30 is very clear that the fire that's being pictured is a funeral pyre, uh, and the idea is the person is going to be burned to ashes. And uh, in Isaiah 66, those who are out there are corpses. They're not people being tormented, they're corpses being removed from the battlefield. They tried to besiege God's, the, uh, the faithful community, the new Jerusalem, in the context of the new creation. And God supernaturally destroyed them.
The author of Hebrews appeals to the consuming fire of Isaiah 26.10 as the fate of the stubbornly unrepentant in Hebrews 10.27. That's worth looking at. And for the rest of the New Testament, as well as the Old Testament, death is the main concept used to communicate the ultimate destiny of the sun, stubbornly unrepentant. If we interpret Revelation's multiple images of the final fate of the unrepentant so that they remain compatible with this broad and consistent biblical pattern, we would take the word pictures suggestive of complete incineration as the more literal, and the word pictures of everlasting burning as the less literal. The theme of everlasting day and night torment for Satan, the beast, the false prophet, and for all who collaborate with them resonates very clearly with the central theme of Isaiah 34. There, the picture of never-ending day and night smoldering and burning is not literal, but has the function of assuring the faithful that the danger from their deadly enemies, no matter how persistent or how perennial, will at last be completely and permanently removed. This purpose of assurance is clearly carried forward in the everlasting smoking, burning, and torment imagery of the book of Revelation, and any attempt to force the imagery to bear more meaning, such as literal everlasting toxic burning, not only clashes with the promise of a new creation, in which God's life permeates all of creation, but contravenes every one of the five solid principles for discerning when to take things literally in the book of Revelation. More than the battle of the proof texts, understanding eschatology, the last things, is about learning from biblical authors how to read their texts. And one biblical author who has been sorely ignored in the matter of the last things is the prophet Isaiah. People just take their literalistic notions of New Testament symbolism and slap them onto Isaiah, and he does not get heard. He, in fact, has been given the deepest revelation as to God's thinking about the final perdition of the lost. In Exodus 33, 18-19, when Moses asks God, Show me your glory, I pray. God agrees to do it. He says to Moses, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the one who is, in your presence. The next morning, God appears to Moses and announces his name, his own self-description, the one who is, the one who is a God compassionate and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. The psalmist affirms that this is God's character in relation to every being he creates. Have a look at Psalm 145, 8-9. It is this God, with this fundamental character, whom we see having a conversation with those who are about to lose their lives forever on the day when God slays the devil, that old dragon, the slippery serpent. In that day, sing about the faithful, faithful, the fruitful vineyard. I, the one who is, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. I have no wrath in me. Will someone bring me briars and thorns in battle? I would go to them and set them all on fire. Instead, let them come to me for refuge. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. To the very last second, God remains ready to reconcile with those who repent. There is only one reason and one reason alone why some of those created to be God's children must ultimately lose their lives and that lies in them. Once again, we have peace repeated twice in this passage. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the one who is, and I will heal them. But the wicked are like the tossing sea which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. 
There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked.